Good morning. A month ago when I first heard that Alan had died, I couldn't believe it. I'm sure you had the same reaction. It didn't seem possible then. It still doesn't quite seem possible. I'd spoken to him just a few weeks earlier. He was in the hospital. I knew he was in tough shape, but I never imagined he'd pass so quickly, so unexpectedly. I can still picture our Alan standing at the back of the church with a big smile on his face back in the days when we handed out bulletins. Or I could remember him back there telling me that he was getting ready to go to Florida and he'd see me in the spring. But here we are gathered in the church that meant so much to Alan. We gather as a community of friends and family that knows grief never ends, but it changes. It's a passage, not a place to stay. Grief is not a sign of weakness nor a lack of faith. It is the price of love. And every one of us has paid love's great price. Now, if we could script our days, we wouldn't be here, would we? If we really got to script our days, Alan would have gotten up this morning. Maybe he would have taken a walk and grabbed the paper. But we don't get to script our days, so here we are. We're here tasked with a few things, certainly to give voice to our sadness and sorrow, to be with people who loved Alan, your brother, your brother-in-law, your uncle, and to be with people who can help us carry this pain. But most of all, we come to celebrate a truly remarkable, loving person, a man who loved life, who lived with purpose and passion, who was anxious to get the very most out of each and every day. So let us do all things appropriate for such a day as this, and when evening comes, let us do what we should do every day. Give thanks for the life of Alan Beard. Please join me now as we sing hymn number 237, I Come to the Garden Alone.
And now please join me in a word of prayer. God of this life and of life beyond this life, we thank you for the gift of life. From the very moment of our birth to the moment of our last breath, we live amidst the wonder and beauty of all life. And we truly marvel at the gift of what it means to be fully human, fully alive. This morning, we are particularly thankful for the gift of Alan Bird, Beard. His life was a gift to us and so many others in our world. Loving God, we thank you for the gift of love, for the wonder of human relationships, the ability to know another and to be known, to be accepted, to, be, to live in the depths of meaning together. We are particularly grateful for the love we knew and experienced from Alan and the love we could offer him in return. Grant that each of us may hold on to shining moments of memory, that we may carry these in our hearts as a candle, a companion in our darkness. And we believe even in times of sadness like this, there is always room for laughter. May we remember that the joy that comes from loving and friendship always remains with us. For it is through each of us that Alan's memory stays alive, that what he believed in, what he stood for, will be carried forth. And so today we remember his smile, his compassionate, generous, generous spirit, his love. And then we ask that you would have enfold especially Bruce and Karen and all who loved Alan in your love. And may our presence offer support and comfort to them. Ever present, God, receive our prayers. Amen. And then please join me in the familiar words from Psalm 23, a psalm that has comforted many people over the years. It's printed in your bulletin. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I met Alan 18 years ago. We met to talk about his wife Jean's funeral. Death brought us together then, and it brings us together today. Alan's heart was broken at the loss of the love of his life, and he was never afraid to share the depth of those feelings he had for his gene. He was never afraid to be vulnerable. And after her death, despite the pain, Alan would resume his living. He didn't retreat or throw a pity party, but his heart never fully recovered, never fully healed. The mere mention of, his name, of her name always brought a tear to his eyes and quiver to his voice. It'd be nice if more men were like that, not afraid to reveal what is going on inside in their hearts. Alan was one tender-hearted, sweet soul. And even after Jean's death, Alan continued on in his role as Uncle Alan to Jean's family. I spoke with Nina the other day, and she mentioned what a wonderful, wonderful person Alan, Alan was, and how involved he remained in the lives of their children, showing up at birthdays and graduations, always, always offering their, his support and love. And if you close your eyes for a moment, <clears throat> I'm sure lots of thoughts and images, memories and pictures of Alan will come to your mind. For me, words like gentle, and kind, soft-spoken. I see that beautiful smile when he had an inquisitive way of being. Now, some of you may have met Alan when you bought your car. When most of us think of car salesmen, we probably don't have a lot of positive things that come to mind. But Alan truly was the exception. He always had the best interest of his customers in mind. He loved his customers, and they loved and respected him. And then I can picture Alan 
cruising around the lakes region on that little scooter of his, or sitting at the bar at Patrick's, bending his elbow. <laughs> Alan was a great giver, always giving back, offering himself, looking for ways to make the world a better place. He did that years ago after high school graduation with his service in the Army, and later through his service to other organizations and the churches he attended. He was never a spectator, but always engaged, and that's the very best way to live. Always eager, always looking for ways to make a difference, to use your gifts to enrich the lives of others. So all of us have so much to learn from our Alan. Have goals, have big dreams, live and love with your whole heart. So now I just invite you again to close your eyes, whisper a quiet thank you to Alan, but don't simply build a shrine in your heart to his memory. Do what he did. Live the good life. Love those entrusted to your care. And if you do those things like Alan did day after day, then your life like his will be worthy not only of remembrance, but of great celebration for years to come. Amen. And now I'd like to invite uh, Alan's brother Bruce to share some thoughts with us. too quick. It wasn't due. Just falling down was the start of it all towards the end. Breaking his femur. Well, let me, let me digress. Um, where do I start about Alan? Well, I'm going to start at the beginning. I got a little insight of what it's like to go up with my brother. And I can recall living on the corner of Walnut and Pearl in East Rochester. And, you know, the house looked big to us at that time. Now it looks a little small. We shared a bedroom. We had bunk beds. We always played tug of war with the blankets, and he always won. You know, um, Alan also had a problem. He, he slept, sleepwalked as a youngster, a young man, a young child. And I'd, make up, I'd wake up more mornings in the middle of the night, and then my parents were running down the hardwood stairs because he'd piled up at the bottom of the stairs. Never, ever got hurt, ever. I don't understand it. You know, living with Alan through Hurricane Carol, and I was really upset. I think he was too. We lost a swing set to a tree. You know, it's those little things. You know, the little things you remember. Back then, you know, it was post-World War II. And everybody that had Rome had a victory garden. And I can remember us grousing out there, weeding our parents' victory garden. But... We really liked the vegetables and stuff that came out of it. Well, we think we told them that we did. And, and Alan's work ethic started young, too. Um, I can remember he got a job. His neighbor had commercial gladiola growing. And Alan, along with some other kids, uh, would, would weed these godly long rows. 25 cents a row he got paid for weeding, weeding them. But he did it because he wanted some money to buy something. And, you know, my you know, father was a school teacher. And, and I could remember him telling us that we got to earn our way. You know, it's no, really no free ride anywhere, especially after the war. And I can remember, you know, we paid it back to our family. I can remember Alan, along with myself, and all the other male 
cousins helping our grandfather down at the dairy farm get the hay crop in. And that's where I learned to drive, you know, in the fourth or fifth grade, behind a track on a tractor. And uh, you know, it's all part of it's all part of work ethics. Um, you know, my father being a school teacher, they didn't make a ton of money, and so he got a chance to move our family to Laconia. They built a brand new junior high school on the shores of Lake Peachy. And I can remember the day that we came around the corner, the moving truck, Pelletier's moving, was there unloading, and we looked and we saw the lake. And Alan said, wow, did you see the size of that lake? <laughs> Doesn't seem so big anymore. <laughs> Just little insights, you know. Um, you know, Alan, Alan's love of wheels and motors blossomed when he went from junior high into high school. He's always attracted to anything with wheels and motors. And he had a motor scooter he bought, saved his money and bought this little motor scooter. It was like a moped back then. And he'd drive that thing everywhere. Well, you know what? When my parents were gone and he was gone, guess who took it for a ride? <laughs> no license. Ah, who needs a license? You're just a kid. He never caught on because I'd unscrew the odometer cable. He must, he must have wondered. I, I meant to ask him one time, did you ever wonder why your gas mileage wasn't as good as it usually is? I was at fault. <laughs> and Alan, you never knew what he might be driving next. He'd surprise you. You know, first, he, I can remember he had this old Volvo humpback thing and got it running, and we went that. And then he bought a Corvair. And I can remember showing up to a family function in Keene, New Hampshire with him and that. And my Uncle Leonard, who apparently listened to Ralph Nader in the day, he said, get rid of that thing. He said, death trap. <laughs> Oh, but Alan, you know, he, he could surprise you. He could have a, a beautiful Le Mans or convertible, and then he, you know, then he'd get a beast. He had a beast of a GTO that he restored along with some friends, and it took two batteries to turn that compression over in that engine. Oh, wow, it was, you know. Alan, sir, I gotta take a sip of water, excuse me. Alan proudly served his country. He got drafted, as a lot of us did, and he ended up in the Army and, of course, in transportation uh, in Vietnam. And, you know, after his service, I, I'm not exactly the date, but I can remember he started working at Manta Rolls, and I believe he started somewhere and went to the service writer, then I think he transgressed into, uh, into being a salesman, which he flourished. You know, Alan, he, you want a car? He'd sell you a car, you know, but he'd also tell you, well, I'll find you something different. Um, Alan was always a, a very sharp dresser, wasn't he? Yeah. Yep, no matter where he went, he always looked good. Did you know he had a pair of eyeglasses for every day of the week? <laughs> I found that out because I found them. <laughs> oh gosh, the things you remember. I remember when Alan married Jean, and I might tell you that, you know, they lived in Guilford, over here in Chipmunk Circle, and then one day, after many years, she had a brain aneurysm and died. And like Mike said, it broke Alan's heart. It really did. It broke his heart. A, a, a piece of him was gone. And, but, you know, he said, he said to me, he said, you know, let's just continue on. Hopefully things will get better. And I, I want to tell you that, um, you know, I'd like to celebrate his life remembering uh, one of the phrases I've heard over and over and over again. And I never get sick of hearing it. I hear, 
Either it's, Elmo's such a nice guy, or he sold me my first car. You say, how many? Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> well, you know what? I'd like to remember him that way, and I'm going to read a little thing that I found in Alan's desk, uh, on his desk, right in front of him, where we sat in Florida. And uh, I'm not sure if it came from another funeral, but I'm going to plagiarize it. I'm going to read it, because it makes a lot of sense. It's called Take the Time. And take the time to think. It is a source of power. Take time to play. It is a secret of perpetual youth. Take time to read. He did that a lot. He read a lot. And it is a fountain of wisdom. Take time to pray. It is the greatest power on earth. Take time to love and be loved. It is a God-given privilege. Take time to be friendly. It is the road to happiness. Take time to laugh. It is the music of the soul. Take time to give. It's too short of a day to be selfish. Take time to work. It is the price of your success. And take time to do charity. That is the key to heaven. I want to thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Alan was a wonderful, wonderful brother. And he was a wonderful, 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 loving son, brother, husband, and friend. I hope you all agree. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you, Bruce. Would anyone else care to share a thought? Excellent. Okay.
Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> Thank you. Oh, please join me. Oh, go ahead. You're the guy that doesn't cut the grass? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, then we're going to close by singing of this part of the service, hymn number 547, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, verses 1, 3, and 5.
Now we bid loving farewell to Alan Beard. We have honored his life with memories spoken and unspoken, thoughts shared and thoughts kept inside. May we continue to honor him by living lives that matter, loving those entrusted to our care, treating everyone like he did as a person, person worthy of our reverence and respect. And I'd like to invite our Masons forward now at this point.
shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror of the night by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. Because thou hast made the Lord thy refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Let us unite our hearts and minds in prayer. O God, our Heavenly Father, we thank thee that even in the dark places of life, in the presence of experiences that we cannot fully understand, thou hast not left us to wander unguarded and alone. Around us, before us are set the ancient landmarks to guide us. The great lights to disclose the path that would have us to travel, ever forward and ever onward to life immortal and eternal. Even though we go as now to a place of rough and dark, we are never forgotten for thy love waits to supply our deepest need. We thank thee that thou hast set some of that love in the hearts of men to give a rich meaning to the fellowship in, in brotherhood. We thank thee also that it is, was our privilege to share with our late brother those common purposes, the common ideals, which bound us together in the great fraternal fellowship of service. O oh God, sanctify to the heart of his loved ones, the sorrow thou callest upon them to bear and help them to understand that the shadow which darkens this hour is but the shadow of thy approaching, the shadow of thine comfort, comfort and presence. For each of us, may this, may this be the hour which deepens our sympathy, rekindles our love, strengthens our faith, and finally sends us from this place to be dedicated to a fuller service to thee and to our fellow man. Amen. Father, may the lambskin, a white leather and apron that I placed up here, the mental vividness and the badge of the nation, remind us of the purity of life and conduct so essentially necessary to any mission of the sexual life of love, for the supreme architect of the universe. Of our faith and immortality of the soul. 
crevice lane and unfolded itself on the other side. The light, the dew, the broadening view were found the same as they were before, and it lost itself in beauties new, breathing its fragrance more and more. Shall claim of death cause us to grieve and make our courage faint or fall? Nay, let us faith and hope receive the rose still grows beyond the wall. Scattering fragrance far and wide, just as it did in the days of yore, just as it did on the other side, just as it will forevermore. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, grant that we sorrow not as those who know not the promises contained in thy holy word, but may we look forward to the great gathering of thy faithful servants and children into their everlasting place of peace and rest. O oh thou in whom we seek to trust, keep us by thy grace, that we may live as the heirs of this blessed and glorious hope, which thou hast graciously set before us. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and, and be gracious unto, unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be with you. On behalf of Bruce and his family, I thank you not only for your presence here this morning, but for the love and comfort you've offered to them. Everyone's invited downstairs to our fellowship hall to share stories and enjoy some good food. There is an elevator in the foyer if you need that as well. And may we go forth holding on to this idea that uh, may the courage of the early morning's dawning, the strength of the eternal hills, the peace of the evening's ending, and the love of life be in your hearts now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.